Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Devin. I'm with the Worcester Public Library, and we are here with Judy Polkin, who is a registered dietitian. She provides information and guidance to help us make effective and healthful dietary changes. Today, we're going to be talking about the Mediterranean diet, which I don't know if you know, but it's been voted the diet of the year several years in a row. So it's a good time to learn about it. But what is it about the Mediterranean way of eating that's so good for us? This class will teach us about the proven health benefits, specific Mediterranean foods, and we'll get delicious recipes that we can try at home. So without further ado, I'm just gonna hand this over to Judy. Thank you so much, Devin. It's nice to see everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen so I can show you my slides. That okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So welcome to the Mediterranean diet. Um, we hear a lot about it and you might wonder, is it really that good? So yeah, it's really good. Um, it's a delicious, uncomplicated way of eating that almost anyone can follow to improve their health. It's one of the best ways to eat that we know of. So if you're looking for something sensible, this just might be it. Um, okay, so what I want to start by defining it. Um, it's a traditional way of eating that has evolved over thousands of years with the environment and with the culture of the Mediterranean. It's healthful, it's balanced, and it's social. It's not really a diet in the sense of a diet that people go on and off. It's more of a way of eating, but you will hear me say diet, um, and you know what I mean. It's a manner of eating, it's particular foods, but it's more than just a diet that somebody might hand you on a sheet of paper. There are principles to it, and I wanna talk about those and how we can incorporate those principles into our lives and our way of eating. As Devin just said, um, you might know that every year um, US News and World Report publishes a list of the rankings of the best, most healthful, effective diets. And they do this in consultation with experts. And this is the fourth year in a row that the Mediterranean diet has been voted number one. And there's a Mediterranean diet pyramid um, shown here, this is put out by a group called Old Ways that does nutrition education. And there's a lot going on here, but let me just point your attention to a couple things. If you look at the foods near the bottom, there's a real emphasis on foods like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, olive oil is in there. Um, and then as you go up the pyramid, there's more animal foods, like there's uh, seafood, and there's poultry and cheese and dare, other dairy. And then at the top of the pyramid, so meaning eat the least of it, there's the meats and the sweets. And we also see, excuse me, I want to, uh, we also see wine and water and down at the bottom of the pyramid, the importance of being active and how it's nice to be social if possible when we are eating. So I want you to be thinking, how can I make my way of eating more Mediterranean? And you might already be eating in a fairly Mediterranean way, or maybe not. And you can, you can change that by just adding a couple specific foods or something about the manner in which you eat. So um, I wanna talk about the health benefits of the Mediterranean diet and how we know that it's actually healthful. Um, it was researched, it, the first data came from a really important study that's still referenced a lot today called the Seven Countries Study that started in 1958. And the lead researcher was um, Ansel Keys, who studied at Cambridge and Berkeley, and he ended up being the director of the, um, something like the Human Physiology, Physiology and Hygiene Lab at Minnesota, University of Minnesota. And this was a long study. It went on for about 25 years, which is really long to follow a group of people. And there were over 
13,000 participants or somewhere around there. So it was a really big, well done study. And he initially wanted to just answer the question, how does dietary fat influence serum cholesterol? And the findings of this study were really important. They found out that yes, in fact, different fatty acids in fats have different influences on serum cholesterol levels. And we all know that now, it seems obvious. You might have heard that saturated fat is generally bad for your cholesterol level and unsaturated fat is better. But that came initially from this study and it's still being studied today. And he, he and his group also found that certain factors like serum cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, and smoking all affect the risk of heart disease and stroke. And again, we all know that today, everybody knows if you smoke or you have high blood pressure, you have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, but it wasn't really known until then. I think some people suspected, you know, about the smoking, for example, but this study really started proving the existence of cardiac risk factors. And what that meant is cardiovascular disease is preventable, which of course we know now today. And they looked at what people were eating um, in specifically several Mediterranean countries and Japan. And they found that the dietary practices at that time were protective against heart disease. So since then, many studies, in fact, hundreds of studies have demonstrated that the Mediterranean way of eating can reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, <clears throat> excuse me, diabetes, some cancers, Parkinson's disease, and lead to better control of rheumatoid arthritis. And for anyone who's trying to control their weight, the Mediterranean diet is associated with lower body weight. So in particular, it might help to reduce abdominal fat, which is that stubborn fat that increases the risk of heart disease and diabetes. So we can possibly reduce that with eating in a Mediterranean manner. And it's likely due at least in part to the fact that a lot of the Mediterranean foods are plant foods. And these tend to be high in volume because they have a lot of fiber and they make us full and satisfied if they're part of a meal. Um, more recent studies show brain benefits. So it seems like by eating in a Mediterranean way, we can improve our cognitive function like reasoning and problem solving. Um, it's associated with a reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease and it may help to reduce stress and anxiety and who wouldn't like that? And it may help with better sleep and reduced um, incidence of insomnia. So I just wanna show the Mediterranean region um, it's where the red arrow was pointing to, and you can see the boot of Italy going down into the Mediterranean Sea. And here's a close up. Um, you know, maybe some of you have been fortunate enough to be to some of these countries, um, but there's a lot of different countries that surround the Mediterranean Sea. So you can imagine there's a lot of different cuisines. It's not just one cuisine, um, although they have certain things in common. This is a list of the countries that actually border the Mediterranean. So at this point, there's 23 of them. And you can see that like what you might get served in Italy might be very different than what you would get in Israel or um, Egypt. So the cuisines do vary. I'm gonna show you some of the foods. There's so many hundreds or probably thousands of different regional dishes. So I'm just gonna show you a few. Most of them are from this website called mediterraneanliving.com. It's a really nice site if you feel inclined to look for nice Mediterranean recipes. Most of them are easy. They all have pictures. And the guy that runs the site divides the recipes into you know, categories like entrees and salads and desserts and vegetarian and so on. So it's really easy to navigate. So here's hummus. Um, interesting thing about hummus that I learned is that many countries and um, even religions like Judaism claim hummus as their own. They say they're responsible for inventing it. 
but nobody knows because there's references to hummus that go back thousands of years or something like hummus. But here's a basic simple recipe for it. It's always gonna involve chickpeas and garlic and tahini and lemon juice and olive oil, or I should say usually, I mean, people can come up with their own versions and use a different bean, for example. And then it can be seasoned differently depending on who's making it. Um, if you make your own hummus, instead of buying it, you have control over the ingredients. Like it doesn't even need salt, even though this recipe calls for salt. Um, and it's certainly gonna be cheaper if you, if you make your own hummus as opposed to buying it. Here's a nice potato salad from Crete. And this is very different than the kind of mayonnaise tomato uh, potato salads, excuse me, that we're accustomed to. This is very light and bright and just looks really good. This one I think is so pretty. I haven't tried it yet. Um, it's a halloumi and watermelon salad from Cyprus. And halloumi are those squares of cheese. And these all have olive oil in them, by the way. Egyptian falafel, which is going to involve ground chickpeas with onions and leeks and seasonings. And yes, they are deep fried. And a grilled cheese sandwich. Um, this is probably pretty Italian. It's got provolone. And what makes this healthier than the grilled cheese sandwiches that we probably all grew up with or many of us, is that first of all, you can see by the name of it, it's grilled in olive oil instead of butter. And it's got those tomatoes in there and it calls for whole wheat bread. And this is very Mediterranean in that it has so many dark greens and again, the olive oil, sauteed Swiss chard with garlic. And this is just very simple, but I think it's a really striking presentation of salmon with asparagus, lemon, and dill. Simple, but you could be proud to serve this to anyone. Just looks so nice. And to honor that asparagus, I have a painting for you. This is by Louise Moyon, who was a French painter who painted in the 1600s. And I just think it's so beautiful, the detail in the fruit. If you look at the cherries um, and the asparagus, I love the white stalks. And she painted, she was well known and appreciated in her time, which was very unusual for a woman artist. And she even, some of her paintings were bought by King Charles of England and by French nobility. So the diet will vary based upon the region, but I want to talk about some of the common features, regardless of which country or region it is, um, aspects that we can all adopt. Even if you have tried some of these foods and maybe you think you don't like them, like maybe you have tried falafel or hummus and it's not your favorite, um, there's bound to be some types of Mediterranean foods that you like, I'm sure of it. Um, so let's, you know, let's talk about how we can do that. Um, so it's a plant-based way of eating, no matter which region we're talking about, there's going to be a lot of plant foods, generous amounts of fruits and vegetables, some of those at every meal, fruits and or vegetables. There's a lot of chickpeas <clears throat> and a lot of lentils that are used um, and other beans too, as well as chickpeas. There's a lot of nuts like walnuts, almonds, macadamias, pecans, hazelnuts, and cashews and other nuts. And that's really good because nuts are really good for us. And there's a lot of seeds, in particular sesame, sunflower, and pumpkin seeds. And this, this painting is by Matisse, um, just a bright, cheerful depiction of vegetables. There's generally, really always, a focus on local and seasonal foods. There's this thing that is said in the Mediterranean, something to the effect of check your garden and then decide on dinner. I love that, but for many of us, that isn't realistic. We don't all have that kind of a garden. 
but we can still eat what's growing now, um, at least for a good part of the year, um, by, by maybe growing a few things, by going to farm stands, trying to pick what's in season. Um, like if you focus you know, now or soon on asparagus and corn will be coming, um, it's always gonna taste the best and be the freshest if it's seasonal. Here's an example of a dish that you could make in the summer that really focuses on seasonal ingredients. So the cod with heirloom tomato and plum sauce, you know how there comes a point in the summer where there's so many tomatoes and so many plums. And this recipe is really simple. You saute them with ginger and a couple other seasonings, and then you add the cod to the pan. Um, really nice. And by the way, you don't have to use heirloom tomatoes. You could just, it's nice if you want to, but you could use whatever tomatoes you happen to have and like. The Mediterranean diet is palatable. It's not in any way a diet of deprivation. Um, it focuses on fresh, delicious ingredients. And part of what makes it very palatable is it's got a relatively high fat content and fat generally makes dishes taste good. Um, and it, you know that fat, a lot of it does come from olive oil, which I'll talk more about in a couple of minutes. So this is a picture from the Olive Garden menu of the chicken scampi. Maybe some of you have had this. Um, so you know, you, we might think this is Mediterranean. It looks Mediterranean at the Olive Garden and it's got the vegetables and the pasta. Um, but what's, what's the problem here? Um, so um, I'll, I'll just tell you, the problem is generally the portion size. And I'm, I don't wanna single out Olive Garden. A lot of restaurants in the US are like this with the very large portions. And that's not so much a Mediterranean way of eating. Now you could easily get around that by sharing it with someone or by bringing part of it home. Here's a more Mediterranean controlled portion size. The, if this is the cod with tomato sauce and a nice little salad. And of course you could add a little bit of pasta or a crusty bread to that. But in general, it's not the Mediterranean way of eating to have our giant portion sizes. And we probably all know we kind of feel better when we eat in a more controlled manner, not deprivation, still enjoying it, but not those giant portion sizes. Uh, conviviality. Um, Mediterranean way of eating tends to be very social, which we all know has been difficult for some people over this past year, but um, social, um, a happy occasion, enjoying the food and enjoying each, each other's company when possible. And I love how this painting, which I know I've shown many times before in classes, but I love how this painting expresses that. Renoir is the luncheon of the boating party. You can just see everybody is having such a good time um, and they probably enjoyed the food and the beverages very much as well. And finally, for characteristics of the Mediterranean way of eating, and this is actually not so much to do with the eating, but it's just part of the lifestyle. Physical activity is a part of daily life. And this Van Gogh shows, um, you know, going to work um, shows uh, a time when people, people's activity was generally part of their work. So people didn't have to think about joining a gym or how am I gonna fit in my exercise because it was just part of their daily routine. And for many of us now it isn't. So we do have to have that conversation with ourselves about how we're going to be active. Now I wanna show you some specific foods um, that, that fit into the Mediterranean way of eating. This salad has a lot Mediterranean going for it. Um, all it is is greens, chickpeas, almonds, olives, scallions, and it's got a homemade vinaigrette with olive oil on it. But of course with salads, there's infinite combinations. 
you could make a salad every day for a year and it could be different. Or you might have combinations that you love and you always want to make over and over. But for a lunchtime salad, the chickpeas um, would provide some protein and they would provide some fiber as well as, you know, the nuts also providing a little bit of protein. So this is a good combination. Greens are really important in Mediterranean eating. And I recommend you have at least one serving of dark greens, dark greens per day. Um, more is better. Dark greens are so good for us. So this was a combination of broccoli, leeks, and a mixture of kale, spinach, and chard. Um, and I sauteed it and the, the dark greens cook way down. So you mainly see the broccoli here, but by cooking down like that, that generally means that it's really easy to get a lot in because you don't even, you hardly realize you're eating them. But those dark greens are really good for cognitive health and for our eyes. Wild greens are also important in the Mediterranean and a lot of people do pick them and cook them. So here's some, there's others of course, but these are some of the more common ones. What's so interesting is a lot of these we tend to think of, or at least a lot of people think of as weeds. Um, certainly dandelions, most people think of as a weed and we're not too happy when we see it on our lawn, if, you know, if we have a lawn. Um, but arugula has become very popular and it has a nice peppery taste. Um, sorrel, I haven't had it, but people say it has a lemony taste. Um, nettles are one that you have to be careful even touching. Nettles have some kind of a stinger on them and you don't wanna to touch the leaves and they have to be cooked to deactivate all that. Um, anyway, the experts say that we should not pick these ourselves and cook them unless we really know what we're doing because it's easy to mistake something else for them and that something else might be dangerous to eat. It's kind of the same advice that you get with mushrooms. Either you have to really know what you're doing or just buy them. You can buy them at farmer's markets, a lot of these or um, some supermarkets. And also if you pick your own, you know, especially like with the dandelions, there's a chance that they've been sprayed with chemicals that you don't want to be eating. I did buy a large bunch of dandelion greens and cook them recently. Um, this bunch from Wegmans was so large that we got three meals out of it. Or it was part of three meals. All I did was steam them. They were delicious. Um, they have kind of a bitter taste, but I enjoyed it. It's kind of the same way broccoli rab has that bitter taste. They, they were really good. And I found I even like them raw in a salad. So if you haven't tried them, I would try them. Um, where would we be without tomatoes? Even though they didn't originate in the Mediterranean, they're a big part of Mediterranean cooking now. And I love this recipe. I've had it for many, many years. Um, it, it came from Gourmet Magazine in 1995. Um, this is a pasta sauce that you don't cook. So you make the pasta sauce with the tomatoes, the peppers, the garlic, a little bit of cheese, olives, um, olive oil and vinegar, but you don't cook it. You just let it sit for a while and then you put it on your pasta. Um, I've modified the recipe a little to specify, specify whole grain pasta, and I cut the amount of pasta in half. This recipe coming from the 1990s specified a lot of pasta because that was the era of, you know, don't eat too much fat, fill up on carbs. But we know better now. So I, I feel that a quarter pound of pasta is generally enough for two people. Um, and this really is a delicious sauce, I think. Uh, root vegetables like potatoes and sweet potatoes and rutabaga, root vegetables are indeed a part of Mediterranean eating. A lot of people avoid them thinking they're too starchy, I shouldn't eat them, but in moderation they are fine and they're delicious and good for us. And this is a Van Gogh uh, with potatoes. And fruit, of course, is very important in Mediterranean cooking and eating. 
And um, all kinds of fruits are eaten, um, apples and berries and grapes and all kinds of melons. But some that show up a lot in Mediterranean cooking and eating are prunes, dates, figs, oranges, and lemons. Um, and this painting by Bernard of red plums, I just think is so pretty with those gorgeous plums. And here's a Monet oat and poppy field showing a gorgeous field of oats with the poppies interspersed. So whole unprocessed grains are a part of Mediterranean eating. Traditionally, all grains were unprocessed. I know it's true, of course, now you can go to the Mediterranean and find some refined grains, but there is an emphasis on unprocessed grains like oats, brown rice, barley, quinoa, rye, corn, buckwheat, and whole wheat. So corn, a lot of people are surprised to find out is a whole grain, it truly is. And buckwheat is delicious. Buckwheat is not wheat, it's a, a, a separate seed entirely. It's, that's just the name of it, buckwheat. That is very good in kasha, um, a traditional Jewish dish, and it's very good in buckwheat pancakes. With our whole grains, the less processed, the better. So something like a tabbouleh shown here is an example of a really unprocessed or less processed version of wheat. Like this would be less processed than if you had bread, even if it was whole wheat bread, because you can see the wheat berries. Bulgur wheat is just um, parboiled cracked wheat. So this, this is really good, by the way, this has parsley and lemon and olive oil and tomato. It's a really simple, easy dish. And a lot of us love pasta. So your perfect pasta, if you want it to be as healthful as possible, is to choose a whole grain variety. So something like whole wheat pasta, or you can get quinoa pasta or brown rice pasta. Um, there's pasta that's made from corn. There's all different varieties now. So find whatever whole grain pasta you like. It turns out that if you cook pasta al dente, it has a lower glycemic index. I was really surprised when I first learned this, but it's true. That means it has less of an influence on raising blood sugar if it's, um, if it's cooked al dente, so a little bit firmer. And of course, with pasta, we always have to watch our portion size and be moderate. So olive oil. Olive oil is essential to the Mediterranean diet. Um, you can almost say if there's no olive oil, it's not Mediterranean. I think every recipe that I'm including here has some olive oil in it. The largest producers in the world of olive oil are Mediterranean countries. Um, Spain, Italy, Greece, Turkey, and several others produce olive oil. Spain is the largest producer. They use it in cooking and in baking. Um, and the health benefits of olive oil are really wonderful. It's highly monounsaturated. And what that means is that the fatty acids that make up the fat have just one double bond. And that type of fat can help to lower the LDL cholesterol, which is the bad cholesterol that, that increases our risk of heart disease. And olive oil has phenolic compounds. Those are what give it its color. Those are the plant compounds in it that give it the rich green and yellowish color. Um, and it's gonna have even more of those if you can get your hands on a good unfiltered olive oil. Those are harder to find, um, but they are out there. Sometimes in Whole Foods or a specialty shop, you can find a good unfiltered olive oil and it actually looks hazy and that's a good thing. The phenolic compounds are anti-inflammatory and they act as antioxidants. So these, help, these compounds um, help to fight disease, chronic disease, and they seem to help protect the blood vessel linings. You can get more from your vegetables, like a salad, for example, by including olive oil with them. 
So if you, like a lot of people, have made a point of purchasing fat-free dressing, thinking, oh, this is good for my health because it doesn't have fat, think again, because the oil, not only does olive oil have all those benefits, but any good plant oil is going to help your body to absorb the nutrients in the vegetables, like the carotenoids, the, the um, beta carotene, for example, um, you're gonna absorb them much better with oil. So you might wanna try making a simple vinaigrette. Here's a very basic vinaigrette recipe, um, any kind of vinegar, whatever you like, um, a good extra virgin olive oil and some nice chopped fresh herbs. And yes, if you don't have fresh herbs, of course it's fine to use dried herbs, whatever you want. And a lot of vinaigrettes are fancier with mustard powder and a little bit of orange juice and whatever, you can do that too. Um, but I, I started making vinaigrettes, I don't know, in earnest a couple of years ago, <laughs> nothing fancy, just kind of like this. And I couldn't find a cruet that I liked. And I remembered years ago seeing them in supermarkets like from Good Seasons. So if you, I can tell you, if you go onto eBay, you can get nice cruets, um, nicer than I see now in the markets, the old ones like they used to make. Here is a Monet, olive trees from 1884. Monet was really good at painting these gnarled, twisted old trunks. He did this in many of his paintings, I've seen them, and it just looks like the tree worked really hard to send its branches and its leaves up to the sky because there's a lot of trees in the orchard competing for the sunlight, and so that's what happens. And here is um, the olive tree of Vouvez, I think I'm saying that right. This is in, on Crete, which is the largest Greek island. This tree is estimated to be, be between two and 3,000 years old. There's many trees in the Mediterranean, many olive trees that are hundreds of years old, and some are said to be thousands of years old. But this one, they're pretty sure, and it looks it. I mean, look at that trunk. And what's amazing is it still produces some olives, and they're highly prized. If you have seen this tree, if you've been there, please, please let us know. <laughs> Put that in the chat box. And you might be wondering, what about olives themselves? Is it, you know, can you eat olives? So olives are, are the fruit where the olive oil comes from. So yes, they're very nutritious. However, they're cured. So they're very high in sodium. So I think, I know we should be moderate with them. They add a nice burst of flavor to your meal. If you like them, they're good in salads and they're really good on cod and chicken dishes and in a tomato sauce. But you know, especially if you have high blood pressure that's hard to control or any reason that you need to watch your sodium, you might wanna stay away from the olives and just use the good olive oil. Mediterranean dishes are flavorful and often what imparts the flavor has health benefits of its own. So there's a lot of use of scallions and onions and for that matter, shallots and chives and garlic. And these have health properties. They can be good for blood pressure and the cholesterol level. There's a lot of use of lemon, as I mentioned, and vinegar, um, and a lot of herbs and spices. I've just listed some of them here, but lots and lots of herbs and spices. And a lot of these have their own anti-inflammatory properties and antioxidants, very concentrated, so really good. Um, uh, saffron is probably the most expensive spice in the world. It's used a lot in Spain, but just sparingly because it's, you know, it's expensive. And za'atar, if you're not familiar with that one, is a Middle Eastern spice blend that you can buy in some supermarkets. I know that Ed Hyder's uh, market in Worcester on Pleasant Street has a very good za'atar mixture. They sell it in little baggies and it's really good. And I like it in soup. Legumes are essential in Mediterranean cooking. Shown here is just simply Swiss chard, cannellini beans, olive oil, garlic, and black pepper. 
just kind of traditional Mediterranean dish, but all kinds of beans are used. Um, it's fine if they're canned. I just like to say rinse them really well. And of course, dried beans are great too. Fish and shellfish are important in some regions, more important in some than others. Um, this is a painting by Dolly um, of, of fish uh, in a red bowl, really striking. Here's some great choices for your fish, um, salmon, sardines, herring, trout, mackerel, and bluefish. And I've listed these because these are among the highest in omega-3 fatty acids, which are really good for our health. And it's nice to have fish at least twice per week, if you like it. Um, moving on kind of up that Mediterranean food pyramid, these are, you know, these foods, these animal foods aren't as important as the plant foods, but they are used. And you can certainly use some dairy like milk and yogurt and cheese. There's hundreds of different varieties of cheese, if not more, but Parmesan and feta are very popular. Um, eggs are eaten, sometimes eggs instead of meat for a meal, and that's good. And poultry, which is um, generally it's best if it's free range. And here's a, uh, a dish that incorporates Greek yogurt. And I don't even think we need to be moderate with yogurt intake. I mean, I, I think a good yogurt is something that we can include in our diets every day, um, especially if it's sugar-free, a, a plain yogurt. So this is stewed prunes with Greek yogurt and cinnamon. And this is flavored with cinnamon and lemon and honey. And I tried it, it was really good. And I like this kind of a dish because it's so versatile. It can be a dessert, it can be part of a breakfast or a lunch or a snack, it can be any time. Here is chicken, um, skillet chicken with lemony mustard greens and olives, just a typical Mediterranean type of chicken dish. And you don't have to have the mustard greens, by the way, you could use any green. I tried it a while ago and I didn't happen to have any greens in my fridge at the time. And I used, I chopped up a bunch of peppers and I've used those instead. So all, most of these recipes are fairly versatile. Red meat, um, it's common to eat, if, if people do eat red meat, it's common to eat just a little, not on a daily or necessarily even weekly basis. It, um, this is a Van Gogh, still life with apples, meat, and a roll. I, I love how there's other foods here and not just the meat. Um, and of course, if you have red meat, grass-fed is best. It's healthier for us, and it's a better choice for the planet. And the cattle had a better life. So it's a win-win-win it's a if you choose grass-fed. And what to drink. So... Water is the beverage of choice. Um, water is so healthful for us. Um, water, you know, if you have water before a meal, it can help to take the edge off your appetite. And water delivers nutrients to every cell. And, you know, it, it's just all around good for us. But also, people drink a lot of tea and coffee, and those have their own health benefits. And the other thing about water is Mediterranean food is so delicious and so tasty that if you have water instead of a sugary beverage, it's not competing with the taste of the great food. Wine, if desired, is certainly part of Mediterranean cooking, uh, Mediterranean eating. Um, it's not essential, but it can be very much a part of it. Wine does contain resveratrol, which is a plant compound that seems to decrease the risk of heart disease it may do that by reducing platelet aggregation, so reducing the risk of a clot forming and then a heart attack. And it may also help to prevent the age-related decline in memory that often occurs. So a little wine can be a nice thing if you like it. It doesn't have to be part of the Mediterranean diet and people tend to have it in moderation and with meals. It's part of a, like a social occasion. So what about dessert? 
Um, you know, you remember it was at the top of that pyramid and a lot of us really like dessert. Well, the way to have a Mediterranean style dessert is if you have it, you know, be fruit based, that can be a good thing. Um, so here's a cinnamon walnut apple cake baked with olive oil. So uh, olive oil, again, is used in baking. And, you know, if you want to give that a try, but you're not entirely sure you're going to like it, you could try using part olive oil and part whatever else you were going to use as shortening and small amounts of dessert. You can see this is a fairly small piece of cake. Um, so enjoying small amounts at a time. So now I wanna know what will you do to make your way of eating more Mediterranean? So if you think of something, even just like one food you might add or one thing you might change about the way you eat, please put it in the chat box and we'll talk about those. I would love to do that. And I have one, this one more painting to show you because the olive oil is so important in the Mediterranean. Here's a beautiful Van Gogh of olive trees and just look at that yellow sky um, and you know, just those wonderful olive trees. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and I want to, Hopefully I can see some of you anyway, and maybe we can see if you have anything that you want to mention about either how you eat in a meditating manner or what you might do to make that happen more. Well, it looks like we got a comment from Elaine. She says, she basically eats Mediterranean, but she doesn't know about unfiltered olive oil. Neither did I. So we're both going to look for it. Okay. So yeah, and don't, you know, don't feel that it's not good if it's not, if it's not unfiltered, um, because it can be hard to find and it can be expensive. Um, I, we get it sometimes at Whole Foods. Um, but really, what's really important with olive oil is that you get extra virgin olive oil and that you make sure you're getting one that has like a seal of approval, like the olive grower seal of approval. There's one from the California olive growers and there's a Spanish seal of approval because I forgot to mention, but there has been going on for years, adulteration of some of the cheaper, lesser known olive oils. So you wanna pick a good brand and get a good olive oil, extra virgin. Uh, we got a comment from Allison. She's wondering if there are any good Mediterranean restaurants in the area that mm -hmm. people might recommend. I know of one, but I can't think of the name, so I'm looking it up. Okay, yeah, look it up. Um, hi, Allison. I don't know where you live. We like Arturo's in Westboro. Um, I guess I, I would call that Mediterranean for sure. El Basha, El Basha Judy. Pardon me, Ruth. Hi. El Basha or Basha, however. It's oh yeah, yeah, El Basha, Basha for oh, sure. I was trying to look up. I like thank them you, too. Ruth. Yeah, and there's a couple locations, right? Westboro and Worcester. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. If if anyone else can think of any others they want to recommend, please let us know. Pardon me. Somebody recommended, in the context of a different discussion, um, I think it's called Ollie's in West Boylston as an Italian restaurant, but I haven't tried it. it but I looked at the menu and it looks really good. Uh, Tish says that her goal is to have more greens and salads with homemade olive oil dressing. Great, glad to hear it, Tish. I've been, um, I've been substituting olive oil for other for butter or margarine or in baked goods for quite a while. And it, I, I, haven't, there, I haven't used extra virgin olive oil because sometimes it's too strong a taste. It depends on what you're putting it into. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I've been doing that for a while and everything comes out the way it used to with the butter or margarine. Great, thanks Ruth. And okay. yeah, you're right. I think that's a really good use for olive oil that's not extra virgin olive oil. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes there were charts available online. Sometimes for baking, you have to adjust the amount of olive oil 
in comparison to even if it was canola oil and you're using olive oil, you sometimes have to adjust the amount. Okay. And, and I have found charts that that show you what to do when you're using olive oil in place of other shortenings. I have one of your charts. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes you yes. do. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> yes, I do. Thank you. Yes, you do. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I've tried baking with olive oil too, and you can't tell. <coughs> Anyone I, else? I just posted a few links in the chat box if people wouldn't mind filling out a survey to let us know what you thought of Judy's program today. There's also a link to a blog with more nutrition resources. And we have more like healthy living cooking classes coming up this spring. So uh, the calendar link is the third one. I liked Tish's idea of making homemade dressing. That's something I've always thought about but never got around to. Yeah, most of the dressings that we buy have, first of all, most of them aren't going to be extra virgin olive oil. Um, and a lot, a lot of them have a fair amount of sugar added and salt. So if you can make a nice vinaigrette, and what I like to do is store it in the refrigerator, but then I, when I think of it, I take it out of the refrigerator maybe a couple hours before I'm going to use it, if possible, because sometimes the olive oil congeals. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoy the homemade vinaigrettes. I hope, I hope you like them too, whoever tries them. Well, Lester says the biggest challenge for him is significantly reducing red meat. Mm -hmm. I know that's a challenge for a lot of people. I just posted that link in there for you, Lily, in the mediterraneanliving.com. I wrote that down for myself because that looks like a great site for recipes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, Lester, so one thing you can do is take one day a week, maybe that you normally would have had red meat and just plan out ahead to have something else instead. Um, and also just go slightly smaller portion sizes. It's good. Yeah, yeah. Thank have you. a have a, you're welcome. You know, having a few extra vegetables just so you don't feel hungry might help. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, I want to continue to explore those wild greens. Mm -hmm. Haven't tried the dandelion greens, which I had tried many years ago, but then, you know, tried again recently. They were so good. They have so much more character than some of the blander greens that we might buy. I mean, I love romaine and everything in a salad, but mm -hmm. eating those dandelion greens in the salad you, it has much more of a taste. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. I have a question for you, Judy. Um, I know we're getting into zucchini season, which can be used in Mediterranean cooking. And I found myself wondering if you can freeze zucchini and Google told me different things. So I wasn't sure what to think about freezing it. Has anyone tried that, freezing zucchini? I would cook it first and then freeze it. And then freeze or it. even blanch it maybe. Okay. Although, aren't there frozen vegetable mixtures that have zucchini or summer squash in them? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess you could just try it and find out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lots of fun things to do with zucchini. Well, pick the, pick the site that tells you you can and give it a try. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> See there you go. It's so interesting how you can get conflicting site information on the same exact question. Sometimes you want to throw your hands up and you just have to go with kind of head in the direction you wanted to head in, like, like Ruth said. Well, Jean said that she read that shredding zucchini before freezing is the best way. I was wondering about that. Mm -hmm. so okay. Okay. As long as whatever you're going to do with it, you want it shredded, but sure. Yeah. Does anybody ever make zoodles or have you purchased zoodles? So zucchini noodles? Long yeah. time ago. Yeah. Yeah. Good way to cut back on the carbs if you need to do that. Just you've got your, your noodles, but they're really zucchini. I do. Bring, I did bring a couple uh, books to share. So the library has a ton of books about the Mediterranean diet and Mediterranean cooking. These are just two I wanted to share. Um, it's Everyday Mediterranean Diet Cookbook. And this is by two registered dietitians like Judy. Uh, one is Serena Ball 
And the other one is Deanna. And she has a really long last name. But this one I thought was just what it says, like great for like easier everyday recipes and like all cookbooks I enjoy. That's some really great pictures. That looks beautiful. That just looks so. This important. is like, yeah, it's a roasted eggplant, and it uses the Greek yogurt that we've been talking about. Oh, it's got that zatar spice that you mentioned as well. Red peppers and a little bit of honey. So I thought that was an interesting one. And then this probably isn't an accurate portion of pasta. <laughs> But there's this recipe where you use pureed beets to make your Alfredo sauce, which I thought was interesting. Wow. And they recommend you could also use carrots or squash. So um, wow. just to help you way to make an Alfredo for your pasta, which I thought yeah, was interesting. Nice. And then like Judy was saying, there are you know different regions in the Mediterranean. So this is by a Sicilian cook and it's supposed to be uh, real Sicilian recipes. The author is Satina Vincenzio. <laughs> wow. This one's a little more um, complex, whereas the other one looks like more everyday kind of recipes. This is something I think that fits in with what Judy was talking about. It's the salad with oranges and olives, which I thought was a really interesting combination. Uh, that looks really good. That looks really Corn good. salad with pecorino and black olives. So I thought that was an interesting combination. And then the other page I wanted to show just has a lot of really great looking um, vegetable dishes, sort of in the fashion of Mediterranean cooking. So here's just some different examples of the types of recipes in here. Like I said, this one's a little fancier if you want to impress your friends after seeing them after a year. <laughs> <laughs> this one might be good. But you know, your local library, I'm sure, will have similar things as well. Yeah, I'm hungry too, Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's something to be said about cookbooks. Like even though we can get any recipe we want these days online, there's really something to be said about thumbing through a cookbook, whether it's your own or from a library, it's, it's nice. It, it can even just inspire you, even if you don't try the recipes, but it's fun to try some recipes too. And I like the fruit and in the salad. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else think of anything that you might want to do to change your diet, to make it more Mediterranean? I'm a little like anxious about cooking fish at home. Like I know that's a big part of the Mediterranean diet, but that's something I've never gotten comfortable with personally. I mean, so many people say that. I mean, you don't, you don't have to cook fish at home if you prefer not to, although it can be really easy. Um, and it's, it, you know, fish is not eaten, it, it, you know, everywhere in the Mediterranean, just some places more than others. You can have a nice Mediterranean diet without, you know, cooking it or eating it often. Are but you if you want to try it, just try a really simple recipe. Like maybe the cod with the tomatoes and the plums. Yeah, that looked easy and um, delicious. Yeah. <laughs> I've tried salmon, but it always comes out wrong. Yeah, don't overcook it. That's what I've discovered with salmon. Just don't overcook it. Do. <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Oh, Jean says she found a recipe for cooking frozen fish wrapped in foil. It's very forgiving and you can put veggies and olive oil in there with it. That sounds awesome. It's a great idea. Nice to cook That's it from frozen. Such, yeah. I sometimes cook fish from frozen too, not wrapped in foil, but I buy bags of frozen fish, you know, frozen cod or salmon or mahi-mahi. And sometimes it does go straight from the freezer to the oven and it, it works, it works fine. I, I think a big part of it is not to overcook it. We're used to things taking much longer to cook, you know, chicken, for example, and fish cooks much faster. So you have to keep checking it. 
Yeah, um, Jan says it's great on the grill wrapped in foil. Yeah, I wish I had a grill. <laughs> Tish says, thank you. Excellent information, recipes, and presentation. Yeah, this was really thank good, you. Judy. I, I've seen your Mediterranean presentation before, but you've updated it and added a bunch of cool recipes. So this was oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there's so many good recipes out there. It's easy to do. Okay, well, I guess we're wrapping up. Please don't forget to take the survey about today's program. If you have a moment to just scroll up in the chat box and click on that link. If anyone has any more questions or Mediterranean goals. Yeah, thank you for joining us today. And you never know what you're gonna get on a nice day outside. So it's a good group. Thank, thank you very much for coming. It was nice to see all of you. Take care, be well. Thank you. Good weekend, everyone. Bye-bye.